In this game, we are going to be taking a look at Magnus at his finest in this positional game. Of course, if you want to see more Magnus Carlsen games into the future, make sure to click on the subscribe button below. It's free! What do I owe you? Nothing. It's for free. <gasps> free! My favorite price. And with all that being said, let's jump right into the game. All right, so in this game, we have Magnum Carlsbad, aka Magnus Carlsen, playing with the black pieces in this game, which is why the board is set up in this configuration. And with the white pieces, we've got a person by the name of Helge Sell. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Um, the name has an E at the end. It might be Selle. Um, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. So if I'm mispronouncing it, sorry about that. I'm not a perfect human being. I'm sorry. Do not be sorry. Be better. In any event, the game begins with the moves E4 and Magnus goes for a Sicilian defense after the move C5. And there is a lot of different types of Sicilians. You have the closed Sicilian, open Sicilian. You have gambits, the Smith Mora gambit, a whole bunch of different stuff. I'm not going to go into all of that because this is one of the most complicated openings in the game of chess. The only thing that you guys really need to know is that the Sicilian defense is of course named after the island of Sicily, which is off of the Italian coast located right here. And now we have to move knight to f3 in open Sicilian. And the whole idea behind the open Sicilian is that white wants to push forward into the center of the board on d4, supported by the queen and the knight. And there's not really anything that you could do to prevent this. And so usually it's best for you to just continue your development on your own. So Magnus continues with the move d6, adding some solidity to this pawn on the c5 square. Now we have bishop going out to the c4 square, developing very nicely. Sometimes you see the bishop going to the b5 square and delivering a check onto the king, but there's not too much to worry about in those kinds of positions. In any event, now Magnus develops his knight to the f6 square. And the nice thing about putting your pawn here on the d6 square is that this pawn cannot push forward because if it pushes forward, then of course you can simply take. So because of that, we now have the move d3. And Magnus responds by playing the move g6. And the idea behind this is that Magnus obviously wants to develop his uh, bishop to the Fianchetto square on the long diagonal because you've now given up this control over the d4 square and so Magnus is now going to try and make sure that you never get access to that square again. In any event we now have the move knight to c3 continuing white's development. Magnus now develops the bishop to the g7 square in the same way that we were discussing earlier Fianchettoing onto this long diagonal where it will have long-term pressure. Now we have castles from both players, castles from white and castles from black, and now h3. And all of this is fairly standard stuff, and now out of the opening, we have pretty much an equal position. Um, everything is pretty much zeros if you look at the evaluation bar, and nobody really has too much of an advantage. And so now it's going to be a question of how is Magnus or Magnus's opponent, it's probably not going to be Magnus's opponent, but how is Magnus going to... Uh, maneuver his pieces around in order to actually get an advantage. So first we have the move knight to c6, Magnus continuing his development, and now we have bishop going out to the e3 square. Now bishop to e3 is a fairly standard developing move and it potentially prepares for a d4 push into the future. It also controls anything from going uh, to this d4 square. And now we have a move that looks kind of weird, but there is a very important idea behind it, which is the move a6. And the idea is very simple. Magnus wants to push forward onto the b5 square. That's literally the whole point. And it also prevents anything from going either the bishop or the knight from going out to the b5 square. That is literally the whole point of that move. And now we are going to see one of the worst moves I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm not being like trying to exaggerate or anything. It is literally a terrible move. And it is a terrible move for positional reasons as well as for uh, tactical reasons. And that is the move B3. <gasps> oh dear. This move sucks. I cannot describe to you the degree to which this move is terrible. There's not enough words within the English Lexus. Um, nevertheless, the reason why I'll try to describe to you is first of all, this bishop has no way home. And I'm not talking about the Spider-Man movie. It literally does not have a way to move backwards. It can only move forwards. And the problem is, is that after a move like b5, uh, your bishop's kind of trapped here, boss man. And yes, you can uh, play this move bishop to d5, because that's literally the only move. But the problem is, is that you then lose tactically. And so after bishop to d5, we now have the tactics of knight takes on d5. And now the bishop is opened up onto this undefended knight. And if you take with the pawn, the bishop will take with the knight. 
Here, I'll just show it to you. Pawn takes knight, bishop takes knight, and if you try to take the other knight, well, then there goes your rook. So that is the whole problem with this. In any event, we don't have that exact sequence of moves. Instead, the knight takes on d5, and now Magnus is able to collect the rook in the corner of the board. Bishop takes rook. And now we have a situation after the queen takes on a1 that the queen is now in a very powerful position here on this long diagonal. As you can see, cuts off the king very nicely. But the problem is, is that this knight is not going to stick around for too long. It can be kicked out very easily with a move like e6 at any point in time. But instead, Magnus plays kind of a weird move, and that is with the move e5. I guess Magnus was a little bit concerned of this queen being so powerful, but the problem is, is that now this knight is going to live on the d5 square forever, unless you kick it out with a bishop, with not like that, with a bishop going out to the e6 square. But this is where we have another mistake, and that mistake is coming from white, and that is with the move bishop to g5. Yeah, so if your attack can be stopped by a pawn, as you can see, the queen is being attacked, but if you're attack can be stopped by a simple pawn push and you don't have anything else beyond that, yeah, it's probably not going to be that great for you. And so after the move uh, f6, you don't really have anything. Um, and now the bishop has to go backwards to the h4 square. And you don't want to actually push forward yet. You can, but it's not the best move. The best move is actually to develop your bishop uh, because your bishop has not moved yet. It's probably best to develop it to the e6 square and ask this knight what it's doing. However, instead of that, we have the knight going to the d4 square, looking to lock itself in in the center of the board. It obviously targets this pawn, but it is a little bit of a mistake because now after the move, knight takes on d4, c takes on d4. Yes, you have this open file, but now there is literally no pressure onto this knight. It is going to live there forever. And if the queen ever moves out of the way, you might uh, sacrifice uh, the knight and the bishop, white might, um, for this rook. You could always see that happening. It's always a potential. Nevertheless, we now have the move a3, which is a very slow move. And this is going to allow Magnus to really kickstart everything. And that is with the move bishop to e6, now looking to target this knight and ask what it's doing. And the knight really doesn't have many places to go. It cannot go backwards to any of these squares because it will be taken by this pawn on the d4 square. It also cannot rotate out to the f4 square because, of course, the pawn on e5 will take it. And if you take the pawn on the f6 square, that of course will simply be a trade. And if you try to jump in anywhere over here, the queen can always take you. Same thing over here on the e7 square. And so there's really only one reasonable move that you can play if you're trying to move the knight out of the way. And so to the untrained eye, it really looks like there's only one reasonable move. Now, in reality, it's better for you to just give up the two pieces for the rook and then try to maneuver your way around after that. That would be like the ideal, but after the move knight to b4, what you should realize and what Magnus realizes is that there's not really any great squares for this knight. And so after this simple move a5, there's only one real place for the knight to go, and that is to the a2 square. And the problem is, is that after the move b4, this knight is locked out. And sure, you can play the move a takes on b4 and a takes on b4, but now the rook opens up and the queen is on the other side of the board. And so that long diagonal that you thought was so great, now all of a sudden is useless. And it bites into granite, as you can see. And this knight is going to be completely lost because there is no way that you can defend it. And if you play a nothing move, like for example, if you play the move, I don't know, like rook to here, I don't know. Then after the move of uh, queen to a5, there's no way for you to defend this. So that would be a real big problem. We now have the queen trying to get out of the way to the b2 square, and we have that natural rotation of the queen over to the a5 square. However, after rook to a1, the queen now looks to trade off and plays the move queen to a3. You should not take this. You should move back to the b1 square. That is the best move in this position. The second best move is to take Magnus's opponent takes on a3, Magnus takes back on a3, and the problem is, is you are not fast enough to get this bishop over to defend this rook. And although you can play the move f3 trying to get back, all Magnus needs to do is slide his rook over from the f8 square to the a8 square, and now you are double stacked, and there is nothing that you can do from Magnus bulldozing down on the side of the board. Magnus demolishing his opponent here, he doesn't even care if you take. You 
take the pawn. Uh, bishop takes on f6 because after rook takes on a2, rook takes on a2, rook takes on a2. We are now in an endgame where Magnus is up a bishop. And if we look at the pawn structure, we have one, two, three pawns for Magnus, four pawns, five pawns, and six pawns versus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pawns for Magnus's opponent. Now, Magnus's opponent's pawn structure does look nice. It looks much nicer than Magnus's, but the problem is, is that there's nothing you can do. Um, if you try to touch the uh, d6 pawn, Magnus will just simply bring the rook back, bring the king up, and defend everything. And these pawns being backwards and their, them being so far apart means that the king cannot come and defend both of the pawns on the g2 and the c2 squares. Consequently, this means that Magnus is in a winning endgame. And Magnus knows that he's in a winning endgame. Magnus has this magical ability to be able to know when he's in a winning endgame and when he's not. This, at this point, he knows he's in a winning endgame. So now the question is of technique. We have to move bishop to e7 going after that pawn. Magnus, of course, backs up to the a6 square. Now the king comes up to the f2 square trying to get into the game. Magnus now targets the bishop by playing the move uh, king up to the f7 square. Where's the bishop going to go? Magnus's opponent now plays the move bishop back to h4. The problem is, is Magnus now can just completely go back to the a2 square and target this pawn on the c2 square and this bishop cannot come back because of course it will be taken by the king. Now we have an issue and after the king moves back to the e1 square, Magnus can lock that king onto the back rank after rook takes on c2. One of the pawns is lost and these pawns are not going anywhere just to let you know. Spoiler alert. And now we have the final nail in the coffin. The best thing to do is to go back over here to the f1 square to secure this g2 pawn. But unfortunately, Magnus's opponent, I'm not entirely sure why, Magnus's opponent plays the move king to d1, and this is the wrong move, playing a one mover, but completely negating the pawn on the g2 square, which is subsequently lost. Rook takes on g2, and now the nail in the coffin, bishop to e1. And now the king is completely cut off, and so is this bishop. Now, the bishop does target this pawn on the b4 square, but the problem is, is that it's not going to be able to actually collect it because now Magnus can play the killer move, which is the one move in this position which absolutely destroys everything, and that is the move bishop takes on b3 with check. That is the most important thing about this, is that it's with check. The king must move out of the way to the c1 square. It does not have any other moves. And now Magnus, not being greedy, not being too quick, he plays the silent killer. Rook to g1. And now the rook pins the bishop to the king. And so the king now must move up to the d2 square in order to try and defend. But now Magnus moves his bishop out of the way to the a2 square. And this pawn's going. And there's no way you can stop it. Magnus could even sacrifice here if you don't do something immediately. And there's nothing really here that you can do. Magnus's opponent plays the move h4, throw away move. We now have b3. The king moves over to the c1 square trying to stop it. And by the way, this just shows you how killer Magnus is. Magnus is like, no, I'm not going to take your bishop in order for you to get close to my pawn and stop everything. I'm going to play the move rook to g2. And now the king cannot get closer. It is being cut off. And so all of these squares are being taken up. So the king cannot move anywhere. We now have the move king back to d1. And this just allows the pawn to get close. b2. And now there is no way for Magnus's opponent to stop him from queening. We now have the bishop going to the d2 square in order to try to block. But now we have b1 queen with check. And this would be checkmate. Of course, the queen taking away the squares uh, for the escape. Except for the fact that the bishop now goes to the c1 square blocking. But now Magnus has the killer move, bishop to b3 with check. Delivering a check onto the king, the king cannot come up because it is being blocked off by this rook, and so it has to move over, it slides over to the e1 square, and now it is a simple ladder mate with queen takes on c1, check and mate. The queen takes away all of these squares for the king, and the rook takes away all of the squares in front of the king. And so this was the final position of the game where Magnus absolutely destroyed his opponent. What an incredible game from Magnus Carlsen being able to absolutely out maneuver his opponent and to be able to push the knight back and trap it in the corner, forcing the queen to try and defend, of course, 
being unable to. And this demonstrates just how complex the Sicilian defense can be. Nevertheless, I hope that you enjoyed that game. And if you want to see more just like it into the future, click on the subscribe button down below. We are a small channel. We're trying to grow and it is free. And of course, if you want to see more Magnus Carlsen games right now, click on the playlist, which is floating somewhere up here. I hope you enjoyed the game of chess. Hope to see you in the next video. Take care.